hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. So today I wanted to celebrate the four year anniversary since I had my stoma surgery. Yes, it has been over four years now with me and Mona, my ileostomy just hanging out. <laughs> All right, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, stoma, ileostomy, surgery, what on earth, I have a whole playlist that kind of takes you through that whole journey. I have ulcerative colitis and I had a really severe flare up and I needed emergency surgery. That is the <laughs> short of it and I now have a stoma. So I wanted to make this video all about things that I've learned about sex and relationships since my stoma surgery as a sex educator, but also just as a human and actually there's going to be a whole separate video about stoma and pregnancy stuff so I'm not going to get into that in this video but don't worry that is coming. All right so let's dive in. Things that I've learned about sex and relationships since my stoma surgery. The first thing that I've learned is about the importance of disability inclusion in sex and relationships education and in just general discussions about sex and relationships. Disability is often left out of these discussions and it is often the last thing that people think about when thinking about things like inclusion and intersectionality. It's definitely a lens that I failed to see sex and relationships relationships through until it affected me personally and I think this is a very normal thing for a lot of able-bodied people who don't interact with other disabled people on a regular basis it's just something that is not considered until you are impacted by it which is a real shame because disabled people are the largest minority I've been learning about a lot of different needs that people may have when it comes to sex and relationships what makes a sex toy accessible or inaccessible depending on those needs and also learning about some of the laws and rights around sex and relationships as a disabled person and oh boy is there a lot to unpack there. The second thing that I've learned is that sexuality is not linear. I feel like we have this assumption or expectation that either our sexuality is just going to always stay the same or we're always going to be improving and growing and learning and expanding our sexuality but that is just not the case. <laughs> what I've found to be more realistic is that in our sexual lives there will be ups and downs, there will be phases, there will be seasons of things, there will be times when we feel like we are moving forwards but then there'll be times when we feel like we've taken several steps back and there's lots of learning but also a lot of unlearning. Sexuality is not a clear path and there are not certain ages or life stages when you're supposed to have had certain sexual experiences. And guess what? Life can throw a spanner in the works which just <laughs> blows everything up in your face and you have to reassess. The third thing that I learned is that orgasms, or at least my orgasms, require core strength. So I had open surgery, which meant they cut me down my stomach, sliced my tummy open, and I couldn't orgasm afterwards when I was in recovery and building up my strength. My orgasm did eventually return, but that was a real learning moment for me as I was like, mentally feeling horny, physiologically very aroused, like getting to that brink, but my anatomy, my body just like could not push me over the edge. I just did not have the core strength to do that. The fourth thing that I've learned is that just like sex and gender, disability is not binary. It is not a case of disabled and not disabled. Some people experience temporary disability. I know that I felt and looked probably as well the most disabled post-surgery and when I was in that recovery process. The One of the ways that I like to think about it now is not a case of this person is disabled or this person is not disabled, but there is something that is disabling them. So maybe you're not disabled and you don't identify with the word disabled, but maybe you have mental illness or something like IBS, which you find incredibly disabling in your day-to-day -day life. There are so many different physical and mental health things that can impact you daily, impact things like your sex life, your relationships, and your body image. For me, my first trimester of pregnancy was incredibly disabling, but I wouldn't have been classified as a disabled person. I was 
a pregnant person, but oh boy, was it disabling? When we think of disability in this binary of disabled and not disabled, it creates this kind of us and them mentality when actually anyone can become disabled at any time. And whilst that might not feel like a very positive thought for you, I think it is a really important one for us all to be aware of. And also your relationships and your sex life may be impacted by disability even if you aren't disabled yourself, whether that's friends or family members or partners who are disabled. The fifth thing is that pausing sex isn't a mood killer. As a society, we tend to place spontaneous sex on this pedestal of this is the holy grail of what sex should be. It should be spontaneous and you should just be in the throes of passion and nothing is stopping you. It's amazing, it's sparks flying everywhere, hot, 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 sexy times. And we have this assumption that pausing for whatever reason, whether that's putting on a condom or checking in with the other person or needing to go to the toilet kills the mood. But from my personal experience, I've just found that this is not the case at all and we need not be afraid of pausing sex for whatever reason. I have literally paused sex to be like, oh, I need to go and empty this bag of shit that is attached to my body and then returned to continue to have really great sex. So, you know, if I can say that and it doesn't kill the mood, then you can check in with the other person put on a condom, do whatever it is that you need to do and continue your sexy times. The sixth thing that I've learned is around body image and how our body's appearance is also not a linear thing. Other than the fact that we are all just constantly getting older, but that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Bodies can change for all sorts of reasons at all different ages. And I think that this is something that we just need to accept as an inevitability instead of fighting it or fearing it or being angry and sad about it. My body so far in my 30 years of life has gone through four significant changes puberty coming off the pill when I was in my mid 20s, my stoma surgery and pregnancy. And I'm sure there are many, many more to come. These changes aren't good, they aren't bad, they're just different and that is fine. The seventh thing is that my stoma surgery actually led me to discovering crotchless underwear and sexy lingerie. So this isn't something that I need during sex, but having the stoma definitely made me do a bit of sexy problem solving and it can be a lot of fun. So my stoma bag is kind of like dangling off my body. It does have this Velcro on it where I can fold it up to make it smaller. And I always do that for sexy times because then it's just like out of the way more, but can also wear some like sexy crotchless underwear, like full body kinds of things that keep it flattened down. You can't even see it. It's like out of sight out of mind and you can carry on with your business. This was the first one that I bought and probably still my favorite. It's got the whole crotchless thing going on. I love the neckline here. Mm -mm -mm. And then it just goes across my stomach and can hold my stoma bag down, out of sight, out of mind, doing its own thing. And then I can get on with my own thing. The world of crotchless underwear is a world I probably would not have dived into if it weren't for having a stoma. And so I'm very grateful. The eighth thing that I've learned, which is super cliche as a sex educator, but very important, and that is communication. This is all about your wants, your needs, your desires, your boundaries, checking in with the other person. Something that I hear a lot and probably have also myself said a lot is that non-disabled people could learn so much from disabled people about communication during sex. Monogamous people could learn so much from non-monogamous people about relationships. And vanilla people could learn so much from kinky people all about consent and communication. And why is it that the mainstream is so bad at these things. It shouldn't be reserved for certain groups where it feels like it's more of a necessity because it's a necessity for everybody and learning these things is so valuable. And that's just one of the reasons why including disability in sex and relationships education is not only valuable for everyone, but most importantly, 
so crucial for disabled people as they are so often left out of these conversations. So as I recently celebrated my four year stoma anniversary, I thought I would also answer some of your questions about having a stoma. Ever had any stoma mishaps during sexy times or mishaps in general? There has been one massive mishap in general, which is when we first moved into the flat and it was like our third or fourth night sleeping on this brand new mattress. And I had my first and last <laughs> leakage, <laughs> just poo everywhere. Yay, new mattress. But during sex, we've never had anything quite like that happen, but definitely my stoma just like farting and like making noises during sex and just kind of like laughing and acknowledging it and swiftly moving on. How do you tell new friends about your stoma surgery? This is a really interesting question because obviously like I'm really open about it online so people only have to kind of look me up to know. But when I'm meeting new people, I honestly like don't mention it unless it's relevant, unless like something comes up that would warrant me talking about it because honestly, for the most part, like they don't need to know. And then maybe if we become closer friends, I'll like tell them like, oh, by the way, this thing happened to me. But usually I just let it come up in conversation naturally. What do you want medical professionals to know about your experience? So I know from the comments that I do have a lot of medical professionals who watch these videos. So hello. I'd be more curious to know that just from like what I've been sharing generally, you've taken away and things that you've learned that have been useful for you in your work. But one thing that I will say is for medical professionals to bring up the subject of sex and relationships, that was something that wasn't like automatically talked about. I think it was my dad <laughs> that actually asked the stoma nurse before my surgery. I was just very ill and he knew, he knew that it was something that I would want to know about, but I just like was not in a state of mind to be asking. And so he actually asked the stoma nurse just to be like, so what will my daughter's sex life be like after this surgery? Bless my dad, bless him. But I think you can definitely make it a lot easier for patients, especially adult patients, if you are the first one to broach that subject matter. Do you think you would have felt different about it if you were single at the time you got it? Honestly, probably. I'm very lucky that I was with Dan when I went through all of this and obviously still with him now. And so there was just a lot of understanding there because he had gone through it all with me. Um, but yeah, it's a whole different ball game if you're single and then like dating and having to kind of like show your body to new people and introduce new people to your scar, to your stoma and things. So yeah, I definitely think that would have been very different, but also like knowing myself and knowing my personality, I think it, I wouldn't have let it phase me too much. And I would have just been like, by the way, <laughs> this is a thing that I have. And I would like let them know about it before they saw me naked. This is an interesting question. When you dream, do you have a stoma? And yes, but only sometimes. Not every time that I dream, I'm aware of my body. So maybe I have a stoma in all of my dreams, but I'm just not aware of it. But yeah, my stoma has definitely featured in lots of dreams that I have had, but not at the beginning. I think it did take a while for my like unconscious subconscious self to like start placing the stoma in my dreams. Do you think you will have reversal surgery or are you happy as you are? I'm currently very happy as I am and I think I'll probably eventually have surgery to make my stoma permanent, but I'm not making any hard and fast decisions about that until after I have completed my family, as the doctors have said to me. A lot can change with my stoma and stuff during pregnancy and birth and postpartum, so not committing to anything just yet, but generally having a stoma really suits me, and so I would like to keep that as I know that situation, whereas reversal feels like a whole different ball game and having to learn something entirely new. Do you sometimes make funny jokes about your stoma or sassy comments? Yes, I do. And now I feel like the pressure is on to say something funny <laughs> right now, but that's not how jokes work. But yes, I very much make light of it and have a jolly good time. Are you still waking up at 3 a.m. to empty your bag? Has your interrupted sleep routine become easier, harder, unchanged? So it's definitely become easier. 
at the beginning, I would set an alarm for the middle of the night to like make sure that I woke up so that I could empty my bag. But now I've gotten to the point where I just wake up naturally to go empty it, which is so much better because then I don't have an alarm like waking me up partway through a sleep cycle or whatever and my body just is waking up naturally. So that has definitely helped. And also if I had like an early dinner and then I go to bed really late, usually, <laughs> pre-pregnancy, I can sleep through that entire night without having to get up to empty my bag because I'll have emptied it just before I went to bed and most of dinner will have already come out by then. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed this video and I would love to hear in the comments some of the things that you have learned about sex and relationships through a disability lens, whether that is from like personal experience or just from generally learning about the world and other people. I hope that you're doing well and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.